Welcome back from the break. In Sudan, where armed clashes raged on in the capital, Khartoum, as negotiations between the Sudanese armed forces and parliamentary rapid support forces, RSF, have so far yielded no major progress. Both sides sent their envoys to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, last Saturday for peace talks. A Saudi Arabian diplomat told the media that as dialogue between the two warring parties in Jeddah entered its third day, no significant progress has been made, noting the topic of a permanent ceasefire is not on the table. Despite several ceasefires declared by Sudan's conflicting parties, tensions and deadly fighting persist in Khartoum and other areas. The Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued a statement early Monday stating that the objectives of the peace talks, including achieving an effective short-term ceasefire, facilitating the delivery of emergency humanitarian assistance, restoration of essential services, and scheduling subsequent expanded negotiations in order to achieve a permanent cessation of hostilities. According to the ministry, the two parties have started discussions on humanitarian aid and the restoration of basic public services. It added that dialogue would continue in the coming days. And the Sudanese are pinning their hopes on talks in Jeddah, but there is no sign lasting relief will come anytime soon. There's been no word on progress in the talks, which began on Saturday between the army and the rival paramilitary rapid support forces in the Saudi Red Sea port city. The U.S.-Saudi initiative is the first serious attempt to end fighting between the army and the RSF that has turned parts of the Sudanese capital Khartoum into war zones and derailed an internationally backed plan to usher in civilian rule following years of unrest and uprisings. Battles since mid-April have killed hundreds of people and wounded thousands of others, disrupted aid supplies and sent 100,000 refugees fleeing abroad. Thousands of people are pushing to leave from Port Sudan on boats to Saudi Arabia, paying for expensive commercial flights through the country's only functioning airport, or using evacuation flights. The foreign ministers of the Arab League countries at an emergency meeting in Cairo on Sunday agreed to form a tripartite liaison committee to work for resolving the ongoing conflict in Sudan between the Sudanese army and the rival paramilitary rapid support forces that erupted in mid-April. The liaison committee would include representatives from Saudi Arabia, Egypt and the 22-member Arab League, according to an Arab League statement issued after the emergency meeting in the Egyptian capital city. Noting that the heightened tension in Sudan has already imposed impact on its neighboring countries, the Arab League foreign ministers called on the warring parties to cease fire and to return to political dialogue. Chaired by Egypt, the Arab League foreign ministers were in the emergency meeting at the headquarters of the Arab League in Cairo to discuss the fighting in Sudan and the Syrian crisis. So far, at least 559 people have been killed, and more than 4,000 others have been injured in the conflict. Still in Sudan, the army is committed to resolving the current conflict in the country through dialogue. That's according to Sudan's special envoy, the Fallah al hajj The envoy made the statement in Juba after meeting with South Sudan's president, Salva Kiir, yesterday. He said the Sudanese army is ready to negotiate with the paramilitary group Rapid Support Forces, stressing that South Sudan remains a prime country for facilitating the return of lasting peace in Sudan. Regional political bodies, including the East Africa Community, Intergovernmental Authority for Development and the African Union, as well as the United Nations, are keen on seeing an end to the conflict in Sudan. Sudanese Special Envoy Defala al Hajj has also been confirming that the regular army is in full control. He said this as he was speaking to journalists in Juba just after his meeting with South Sudan President Salva Kiir. His talks with President Kiir were aimed at fostering a lasting ceasefire 
and to grant safe passage to humanitarian support and as well provide an escape corridor for fleeing civilians. The combatants have said they would try to tackle only a ceasefire and humanitarian issues like safe passage. Numerous ceasefires have been violated since the conflict erupted on April 15. The, the Sudanese army is in full control, but uh, maybe I said uh, the elements of the rapid deployment force, the rebellion, uh, has infiltrated inside the civilian quarters and they are now taking, uh, uh, considering or actually occupying hospitals. That is why the army does not want to um, uh, uh, go aggressively uh, because uh, of the safety of the civilians. But at the end, I assure you, uh, the army, w which has an experience of 100 years back, will uh, settle this situation. Sudan's health care system remains under huge strain amid the ongoing conflict in the country, with many hospitals forced to close their doors due to security concerns, while other medics are valiantly carrying on as the fighting continues. Many patients can no longer access treatment in the capital Khartoum and other affected cities and towns across the country, while many people are now having to walk through conflict hit zones to reach the few available facilities which are still open. The martyr al Zubair Mohammed Saleh Health Center in Khartoum is one of the few remaining functional health care institutions still treating patients. The health center was recently closed but has reopened once again to help those injured in the conflict. Health workers in the capital have faced numerous difficulties since the crisis erupted in mid-April and medical facilities have been targeted, preventing the delivery of key supplies to conflict-affected areas. Despite the risks, many healthcare professionals are still offering their services free of charge. EU Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen says Ukraine is fighting to create lasting union and peace. She further said we should never forget that peace in Europe seemed impossible, improbable and far too distant for much of the last century. But she adds that it was achieved. Europe is about making the impossible possible. And so is Ukraine, von der Leyen adds as she concludes her speech. Investigators are working to establish whether a gunman who killed eight people at a Texas shopping mall had far-right links. The 30-year-old, 33-year-old attacker was shot dead at the scene by a police officer who was responding to an unrelated call. During the attack, the suspect wore an insignia, which has been associated with hate groups. Six people, including children, were pronounced dead at the scene in the North Dallas suburbs, while two died later in hospital. Three of the injured, ranging in age from 5 to 61, are still in hospital. Three members of one family, a young security guard and an engineer from India, were among those killed. The gunman, named by police as Mauricio Garcia, used an AR-15 style rifle and wore combat tactical gear during the shooting. He carried multiple rounds of ammunition. A law enforcement said witnesses described scenes of panic and horror when the gunman got out of his car near the Allen Premium Outlet Mall and began firing on shoppers. During the attack, the killer wore a clothing patch with the letter RWDS, which stands for Right Wing Death Squad. This is a phrase popular among right wing extremists and white supremacy groups. One line of inquiry is whether he was motivated by these ideals and whether he had links to like minded people. And let's move on to speak with Maria Bird, our correspondent on the Texas shooting. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Now, what can you tell us on the latest with the Texas shooting tragedy? Well, where we are now with the Texas shooting is continuing to investigate the shooter's motives. I've heard you speak about his right wing uh, attack methods and his association potentially with some white right wing organizations, specifically, as we know, the January 6th attacks 
were predominantly uh, put forth by the Proud Boys, and he did show some signs of uh, potentially having some sort of either ideology following that group of individuals. And so that, I think, is where we are right now, is to understand what the real motives were. Because as you mentioned, uh, several of those uh, who were killed, um, and even those who are seriously and critically injured and still in the hospital today, were mostly of Korean and Indian descent. And so um, as we look at uh, potentially this being a racially or ethnically motivated attack, um, we must uh, look at, as you talked about, the social media. Um, we're looking at, you know, some of his acts previously in the past. We also know this individual was uh, dishonorably discharged from the military only after three months um, due to mental health issues that were identified. They have not been clear as to what those mental health issues were and exactly what occurred uh, for his discharge, but we do know that. We also know the last sign of his employment was in 2017, uh, potentially trying to receive a job as a security guard. It's not clear whether or not he ever was fully employed by that company, uh, but that that is what we see as the last form of uh, some sort of uh, type of employment that he had applied for. So I think at this time, the real question is, are we in America dealing with uh, white supremacy issues that are rising up at once again? Um, what are we seeing as it relates to mass shootings, the second largest mass shooting since 20 in 2023? Um, where are we as a country um, when, as it relates to gun control laws? Uh, we've heard the governor um, come out and speak and believes that we're not dealing with the systemic issues um, and that gun control could be just uh, tapping on the top layer and that mental health is really uh, what Americans must begin to look at a little bit closer. Maria, do you have any further details about casualties and the injured? So we know that there is um, a mother uh, that is critically injured. She had two daughters that were unfortunately uh, lost their lives as a result of the mass shooting. Uh, we know that there are a few others um, that should be potentially having a full recovery um, of the seven that were injured. Um, so at this time, it, the question is really about individuals like that one young boy uh, that lost everyone else in his family. Um, what are those individuals? What's going to be next steps uh, to make sure that uh, there is a appropriate support services around individuals who might have lost multiple family members as a result of this attack? And Maria, you did mention a little bit about his social media. What light does it really shed on his ideologies that drove him to act in this way? Uh, what is shedding, and I think where we are, um, is looking to see, are there potentially right-wing or extremist groups uh, that are collecting uh, collecting together and working together um, through the social media platforms, through other um, internet platforms um, and technology that could be inciting hate crimes? Um, this has not yet been um, um, labeled as a hate crime, but as we look at some of the conversations um, uh, some of the ideology, some of the methodologies of uh, these groups, you can really see uh, that there are some underlying pins of um, supremacist ideology, neo-Nazi ideologies, um, and also obviously um, hate um, as it relates to ethnic groups um, and racial um, differences. And so that I think is where you're going to see uh, the U.S. Defense Department putting more efforts around to see, are we potentially looking at other occurrences like this? Because we've seen them, obviously, um, in the past 12 to 18, um, and you can even go back um, in the past four to five years when we've seen an uprising um, and white supremacy and right-wing attacks. How will this incident, do you think, inform gun control regulations? The president's been calling uh, for further gun control. He's been to Congress. Uh, we've seen, um, obviously, mostly the Democratic Party. Uh, we know the Republican Party typically um, has been strong on the right to bear arms, um, the constitutional right to bear arms. And you can see how uh, Texas is a state uh, that believes in the right to bear arms. And so the majority of Texans uh, are not necessarily in favor of the restriction of gun control laws. We can even see the governor has come out and doesn't believe that that is uh, the solution to ending mass shootings. And so the real question is going to become how strong 
strong is a Democratic Party and those Republicans who might believe uh, that we need to restrict uh, gun uh, gun control in America and to ensure that we either take guns like the AR-15 off the market or potentially uh, put a moratorium on guns and as a whole, um, as we're seeing this extensive increase um, in mass shootings in the U.S. All right, Maria, thank you very much for uh, joining us and for the insight. Appreciate you. And welcome back to the World News Today. Moving on to New Zealand, a teenage boy has gone missing in a cave system amid widespread flooding in New Zealand's Auckland region. He was among 15 students and two teachers who had gone to Abbey Caves, a series of three underground caves. Now, the rest of the group was initially trapped but made it out safely. Auckland, which is New Zealand's largest city, has declared a state of emergency after heavy rainfall stranded cars, toppled trees and disrupted rail services. Late on Tuesday, the search for the missing boy was suspended until first light on Wednesday. He was reported to be in year 11, typically a level for students aged 15 or 16. New Zealand is several hours ahead of us. The Abbey Caves Reserve features limestone outcrops and sinkholes. Rapidly rising water and roof falls in the caves pose significant risks for cavers. Zimbabwe has discovered oil and gas deposits during exploration in the northern Kaborabasa region. According to Invictus Energy, an Australian firm reveals an analysis of five mud gas samples collected from the upper Angwa Reservoir during the drilling of the Mukuyu One well between September and December showed light oil and very rich gas. Invictus Energy Managing Director Scott McMillan said they hoped to get better results from deeper drilling. The sample also showed a consistent high quality natural gas composition containing low amounts of carbon dioxide and helium gas. The discovery of oil and gas is vital for Zimbabwe, having channeled resources into the mining sector in the recent past to boost its economic growth. Not many people visiting China really know about the Mangshan Mountain Resort. Hidden inside of Shenzhou, the Hunan region south of China, it is one of those sites never really to be forgotten. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Amarachi Urban, tells us more. This could have been any other Saturday when a group of foreigners decided to expand their visits in China to include the more challenging Mangshan Mountain. Only it's a weekday, and it all begins with a cable car ride spanning about four kilometers. Oh my God! It is long! It is uh, the first time for us to, to go on the mountain. In my country, we don't have a height more tight than uh, we see here so it's not easy for us to to try to to go on the mountain with a uh, uh, cable cake yeah 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 it's, yeah. Very, it's very very amazing to see this this kind of a curve which uh, mountains which go which goes to the mountains uh, uh, it's a first of all to see it. I, I don't think in our in African countries you can meet or can find this. I did not know where we were going after we hit the clouds. I was wondering if it had more to go when we came up when we hit the clouds. I thought, wow, 
how did they build this thing? We need an explanation, correct? We get to a cleft of the mountain mansion, dawn on raincoats, pay homage to the sculpture of Lao Te Tu, a triangular-headed snake with a white tail said to be becoming extinct and can only be found now on the mansion mountain. Much of the path is obscured by fog and rain showers. On this side, we're going to the mountain. So we're gonna come out and say hi, and then like look around and buy. But no, we're actually walking around the mountain, and it's interesting to say the least. That was but I'm having a great time. <laughs> okay, and of course, this picture taken to tell the story. After about two hours or more for some, we're finally at the top of the mountain. Welcome to a warm reception put together by the Yao ethnic minority local people. Where the Canon restaurant lies, inside is a celebration for us, the guests who showed up two years after COVID. This is only one of the mountains found at the Mansion Mountain National Forest Park. It's probably the most popular and it's best visited for the guide. Well, to rise, you could need a massage after this trip. From Beijing here in China, Amarachi Ubani, Channel Television News. And that's it for the World News Today. I'm Susan Ilian. See you tomorrow.